So thanks all for joining. Um, certainly, I'm sure there'll probably be one or two here coming in in the next couple of minutes, but um, this is our second of the VT ones. Uh, we will have um, a VT seminar, Space of VT seminar series, I should say. Uh, we will have one next week that is a joint one with the uh, Center for Geospace uh, uh, Storms. I'll get the link out for that uh, and touch base with the folks at, uh, I think UNH was the one who were coordinating that. So I'll, um, I'll get that one out and see if we can um, or get the link for that and send it around to our center here uh, so that we can uh, join that one as well as try to get the info of um, what that uh, what that seminar will be about. Um, and I think uh, previously too, there had been problems with, um, are there, we were trying to get a recording of the video. I think they had recorded it, um, but um, there was, there was trouble, I think, getting like a website started. So uh, as you guys, uh, or as people might have seen from last week, uh, I was, I am recording this for, for now. Um, and we'll be able to, uh, a day or two, I do have Friday off. So it might take me until early next week to try to get this posted to the YouTube. Um, but we will, um, glad uh, everybody could join us in real time here otherwise. Um, I did see Dr. Bailey, you are joining us with our Space VT uh, Center Director. I didn't know if you had anything to add on here as well. Uh, no, just uh, thanking everybody for being here. I'm glad we have this good attendance. And uh, as always, in, uh, and as you were doing, encourage students to join. We have a prize for you, so we want lots of students to participate. Or uh, Adam might be hoping that nobody else joins and then he gets the whole uh, <laughs> Whole, whole well, I'll be the stuff. first to say this is there is no novel research or engineering, um, pro, you know, solution here. So, yeah, yeah. So as a as a quick up or intro, uh, this is Adam. Uh, just say your last name for me. I'm sorry. I, I Kimbro. Yeah, Kimbro. Um, the the title that he's given it is the large uh, satellite constellations in radio astronomy, uh, and this is based off of an essay that he wrote for. I believe the second uh, summit on sustainable uh, space. Yep, space sustainability. There's the yeah. space sustainability. I knew I probably had that mixed up. Um, but that uh, essay was selected as, uh, as a prize winning essay, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this is a, uh, uh, on that, and it's about, uh, as the title says, large um, constellations. We were talking about this the other day in our, our group meeting that, um, one aspect that's been considered before um, with uh, large these large satellite uh, constellations um, is the optical part of astronomy, uh, but this is an interesting approach at it from the radio astronomy. So without trying to steal too much of your thunder, I will stop sharing and I will let you uh, go ahead. Sure. All right, so yeah, the title is, I will admit, a little bit clickbaity, and that um, I'm going to be talking about, um, in general, uh, interference in radio astronomy, um, and uh, specifically satellites. And I'll touch on constellations, uh, definitely, but of course, this is all kind of, you know, the scale of constellations is, is very new, and, um, you know, we've had a few hundred maybe launched you know between the two big ones that we know spacex and one one web uh even though one web is kind of t little little divergence there because of the bankruptcy but um yeah so uh and quick background here the reason that um i kind of like to present on this and my background on that is uh in 2018 i worked for the um, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, uh, there at the Very Large Array site in New Mexico. Um, and that was just six months, like a co-op uh, position, and uh, worked specifically with the radio frequency interference team. So gained some insight there. So the agenda, uh, give you a bottom line up front of um, 
things we're talking we're considering in the end um, and then give you context on radio astronomy you know why is it important um, and then you know why is it important to protect and, and kind of historical notes on that and then go into spectrum management and what is involved with that uh, as it pertains to radio astronomy and then uh, we'll talk about the interference that is experienced um, and ways to mitigate that and the case study would be GLONASS satellite um, uh, satellite constellation Russian uh, radio navigation um, and I'll be the first to say that's not exactly um, you know fully um, the same as a SpaceX or OneWeb constellation um, you know it's this one would be kind of like geosynchronous orbit or geostationary orbit one of the two um, is is a little bit different than uh, low earth orbits but uh, same same fundamental interference uh, applies from that and then we'll talk about more techniques and things that might not work and some things that have worked and then ultimately the future needs and what we can conclude so um, ultimately resources need to be uh, available for developing um, you know more modern and, and better technologies uh, in radio interference mitigation uh, at the radio astronomy sites themselves um, and then also uh, sharing the spectrum um, is a huge deal and again this presentation is like sort of like policy i mean the paper it was the paper it was based on is um, a policy kind of paper um, and you know what we got to do to uh, manage that uh, spectrum which is kind of a weird idea from a physicist's point of view it's like uh, how can you manage radio spectrum when it's you know a scientific thing how do you do that but but ultimately we need to um, you know weigh the different competing interests and and make room for for some so uh, RFI identification and excision is super important um, We've done this, but we might need to do it in different ways um, now that we have a large number of satellites. Uh, array optimization as far as um, you know, how we distribute the ground astronomy arrays and uh, pointing and all of that. And then also when we consider the, low, uh, the space mission, um, future space mi missions for radio astronomy, uh, lowering the cost of, of that equipment. Um, so as far as sharing the spectrum, we need to uh, have national and international um, cooperation, as we'll see with the uh, International Telecommun Tele Telecommunications Union, ITU, as a big player there. Um, and yeah, so we have competing interests, commercial and research, but at the same time, they're quite mutually uh, beneficial in that radio astronomy has provided um, a lot of great things for for our technology and um, remote sensing it's helped in like MRI machines uh, believe it or not it was credited for you know Wi-Fi um, because of the fast Fourier transform chip um, that they developed was able to you know sort through the different frequencies that were arriving at different times from reflections um, and you know correlate uh, do the fast Fourier transforms on those. Um, so that was that was pretty big. Um, and then, of course, we need to increase public awareness about uh, radio astronomy and saving the spectrum there. Um, and that comes with investments and better hardware uh, on both sides, uh, the commercial and the radio astronomy receivers. So benefits of observing in the radio, uh, we can track the physical processes out uh, in outer space that have no signature at other wavelengths. Uh, so choose different ones. Um, and also obviously with optical, you might not be able to see through a dusty region. So the uh, radio waves can, can penetrate that certain ones. Um, and overall they, you know, we have Maxwell's equations and Stokes parameters. And uh, when we measure like the power levels at different frequencies, we can actually uh, get information on the magnetic field strengths and and thus their vectors and and uh, orientations. Um, 
we can also get light of sight velocities. And then the obvious one, daytime observing. So optical, you won't be able to do that, but we're in the radio centimeter wavelengths. Uh, we certainly do that when RFI is not present. Here's a picture I took from a past presentation. Um, just to point out the, you know, we have some different frequencies from the sun that we that we uh, look at, and and then we eventually can get the uh, magnet, magnetic field lines uh, from that. But I'll be the first to admit that uh, I'm not a radio scientist, so or uh, space space scientist, so I don't know too much about that. But um, yeah, it's there's a lot of uh, stuff that we get from radio astronomy. So beginning here, my title was not there, but uh, yeah, we have single uh, telescopes and we have arrays, um, but they're all sharing that same remote quiet area. Um, and what comes along with that is actually atmos atmospheric attenuations that are 10 times lower in uh, the dB per kilometer than you know normally you would see in uh, other areas. Um, especially like uh, Alma Observatory in Chile. Um, you know, there are several thousand, many thousand, you know, over 10,000 feet uh, elevation there. So they're passing through a lot more atmosphere, so it makes it easier. Um, and then a really important thing is that uh, we have been kind of seeing a trend to a raise for radio astronomy, and, and that's for good reason. Um, there's a, there's a paper with all the math behind it uh, from A.R. Thompson. And he, he basically shows, uh, as I'll point out later, that um, we get up to 40 dB um, less of the RFI than, than you would from a single uh, antenna, dish antenna. So radio spectrum, um, generally considering it, um, under 3,000 gigahertz um, or three terahertz. Uh, and the radio astronomy facilities, um, as I pointed out, are always going to remote locations. But this, this isn't really new. It's, it's been going on for more than 60 years um, uh, when I think in, in the late 50s is when the radio quiet zones actually started. Um, and those you know, we have one in Green Bank, uh, and they're actually all over the world. Um, and those limit the power from fixed site transmitters. So you can think like cell phone towers or TV antennas. Um, and that helps great for, for terrestrial interference, but uh, they're not so much able to protect the, the satellites that go overhead. Um, at the same time in the late 50s, um, early 60s, we, is when we introduced what we call passive bands. And that's that spectrum, uh, band of spectrum that uh, only radio astronomy uh, is allowed to use. And they're passive, obviously, because they're not transmitting, they're only receiving. So that's, that's super important for radio astronomy. Um, and, and not only radio astronomy, but climate study as well. Uh, lately, you know, is, is a topic that is being considered quite a bit. So uh, it's, it's very important. Um, Along with the radio quiet zones, only a few of them actually limit um, aircraft routes. Uh, a few of those, that would be like a few Australian sites. Um, and uh, Canada's one time had, had a restriction, but not, not many of them. Um, and yeah, of course, we still have the cell phones, car radars, which are up at V band, uh, like maybe 80, 90 gigahertz. Um, and then, of course, our satellites. So um, what do we have to manage this? We have the ITU um, and there's basically some tiers here. It starts at the top with um, the radio regula regulations. That's like the internationally um, binding rules you must follow for all countries. There's mention of radio astronomy in those regulations, but they're more like references, which are references to the recommendations below that. Um, and those are not mandatory. There's no legal um, binding there for, for countries to follow it. Um, so that's the, that's the big problem with um, the RFI we see in radio astronomy is people not 
exactly following this. They're not responsible um, monetarily, you know, to um, pay for the damages. So uh, I mentioned in the abstract that uh, the VLA, very large array, uh, their hourly cost is around, with staffing costs and operational costs combined, is around $17,000 per hour. So, um, and those are tax dollars from the NSF. So yeah, it's, we definitely want to keep, or at least my proposition is that we sort of move those higher up into like regulations, because um, a lot of them are also footnotes, so kind of getting glossed over. And an uh, interesting comment I saw in an article once was uh, comparing it to national park lands, you know, like having it actually have some weight to it. So here's a look at uh, the spectrum uh, as far as the protected uh, passive bands for radio astronomy. Um, not a lot. Uh, we This is showing up to 30 gigahertz. Um, and under 30 gigahertz, it's about 2% of available spectrum. Um, and the, of course, there are uh, observations going on above 30 gigahertz. And, and when, once we go you know, even greater than 100 gigahertz, there's not a lot of um, satellite activity as of now. Um, but we kind of know that it's a race. It's, it's kind of like a race to higher frequencies for uh, both commercial and radio astronomy. Um, so, um, but ultimately the spectrum is eroding from inter interference. And when you're eroding from 2%, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty sad. <laughs> um, as far as the VLA is concerned, these are the um, frequencies that they observe uh, that are protected and that should not expect any interference. Um, I note the passive ones. The passive are the ones where this uh, radio astronomy is the primary uh, service in which uh, they're the only ones that should be using it. And by using, I mean receiving and not transmitting. But the US 74 is that footnote that I was talking about where they're actually a secondary user. And so there's actually um, other services like, you know, earth radars, um, earth science satellites and things like that, that can use it. But the footnote is just telling them that you need to be aware that if your power levels are over the threshold, then, um, then you, you, sh you, know, you should not be interfering. Uh, so, and, and, and I also note that a few of those are spectral line observations, so even more important that they should be protected. Um, of course, that's not to um, say that we should expect the RFI everywhere. Um, we have the detrimental thresholds, which I'll talk about, that were calculated uh, for uh, satellites not to, to go over in certain frequencies. So uh, intentional transmission sources as opposed to unintentional. Uh, unintentional would be something like, um, uh, you know, badly designed um, equipment with harmonics. Uh, like for example, at the VLA, they have their handheld radios they use to communicate across the site. Well, those actually have, you know, second, third, and even I think they saw seventh harmonics on it um, into the radio astronomy. Uh, bands that they were observing. So, um, but intentional is where the, these, these are the satellites that are actually, um, you know, uh, transmitting where they're supposed to, uh, but they come quite close to a lot of um, radio astronomy frequencies. I bold cloud set um, because we're seeing more radars, super high power radars, um, like effective EIRP, effective isotropic radio powers of, um, you know, gigawatts. Um, and those are actually dangerous for uh, um, radio telescopes because if they actually bore sight, you know, they actually look uh, straight down into the antenna, uh, they can uh, burn out the receiver electronics. Um, so, uh, in fact, they, at uh, Alma um, in, in Chile, they, when they were transporting the uh, 60 some antennas, they had to actually put a uh, physical like piece of equipment over the dish uh, to make sure in case the clouds that actually went over at some point to not bore sight. So um, 
yeah, that's um, something to be concerned about. Um, but at the same time, we're, I don't want to say like these should not exist. CloudSat is a huge asset to studying Earth. So, you know, there has to be some, some balance there. Yeah, so GLONASS, um, they eventually move frequency as we'll see. Um, and Iridium is, is uh, definitely another big problem and has been. Um, I want to share this uh, grayscale plot um, from one of the two interference monitors at the VLA. Um, and this shows one 1,000, 2,000 megahertz. Um, you can see some, pointed out some uh, specific uh, satellites there. Um, I don't have the scale on here, but um, the the actual in intensity of, of the, you know, as it gets more dark, that's, uh, you know, more dB uh, of uh, power there. And yeah, like I mentioned, the VLA radios, second harmonic show up sometimes, but yeah, I just wanted to throw this in. It's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so they have two of these at the VLA and they're mainly for terrestrial as well as um, aerial interference, um, but they also have a dedicated like 12, no, it's probably like a, a small, a small dish antenna, very small that, you know, can actually move and uh, look into the sky there. But this is like some vertical antenna. Okay, so GLONASS interference, um, that was, the problem was it was actually in, uh, in the uh, spectral line um, of hydroxyl radical, 16, 12 megahertz. Um, and eventually it was, the frequencies were moved, um, but actually the sideband interference levels didn't stop until 2007 when people, they, you know, radio astronomers actually brought GLONASS to the ITU and, and had them sort that out. Um, but at the time it was power flux density levels of um, over uh, about 40 dB above the threshold, which is huge. It's 10,000 times stronger than it should be. Um, and not only was it just one GLONASS satellite, but the constellation, they each operate at their own frequency. So to collectively, they were minus 198 dB W per meter squared hertz. So uh, for the whole constellation. Um, and these, these numbers, these, these dB above the threshold are not too uncommon um, for ref for um, comparison. Iridium was about 30 dB uh, above the threshold um, when they had the, in 1998, when they had their uh, satellites. Um, and then most recently, you might know about Iridium Next, their latest uh, constellation. That, um, as of most, as of 2019, um, they were about, I think, 20 dB above what they should be. And uh, according to like some, some German um, radio astronomers that measured it. And apparently that was some issue that they were not expecting. So there's a lot of issues that, you know, they don't expect that happen once they launch the satellites. So uh, the mitigation technique for GLONASS, uh, and I get this information from uh, Steve Ellingson, uh, who's from, you know, Virginia Tech faculty member, uh, and got a lot of great information from him uh, on this matter. But uh, essentially, the interference signals could be modeled as sinusoids, um, and, and they were synthesized so that they could then be subtracted out of um, the data uh, afterwards. So um, and that was because the reason it was kind of feasible to do this with GLONASS is because they were using direct sequence spread spectrum, and that has a high interference to noise ratio. So it's um, due to the processing gain of that demodulator for it, for that modulation, it was easy to kind of get it out. Um, on, for Iridium, on the other hand, uh, what they used were um, uh, filters, they try to use filters, but the problem with filters is then you actually uh, decrease what you're, the actual signal you're trying to receive. So a lot of astronomers did not like uh, using filters. So, but yeah, synthesizing a signal and subtracting is one way we can do this. Uh, however, thousands of satellites 
is going to make uh, computational time increase and uh, thus more costs. Um, so it might not be possible with large constellations. More <clears throat> methods here. So, so that relied on high interference noise ratio um, to recognize and remove the RFI. Um, I'm actually not sure what SpaceX's modulation is, but I'd be curious to know because um, that will determine a few things. But um, essentially, we have long integration times um, in radio astronomy, and e so even you know weak source uh, can add up to, to actually ruin data. And also sometimes uh, make data look false, like uh, you had to throw off the astronomer in some cases I've heard. Um, the detrimental threshold I was talking about, um, I, do, is, I don't believe it's actually defined in ITU's um, papers, um, but if you go back far enough, there's one paper where the guy who actually did the math behind them uh, defines it kind of as 10% of the receiver noise level. And they call that T-cis. In uh, radio astronomers call it T-cis. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's uh, averaging 2,000 seconds. Um, like I said, filtering options are, are limited because the sensitivity we need, especially uh, wideband sensitivity. Um, and then back to the arrays. Uh, the advantage we have there is, uh, again, A.R. Thompson did the math here and showed that arrays that are extending up to 150 kilometers from the center of the array, 15 dB less stringent uh, as far as the threshold goes. Um, the VLBI is the array of uh, radio astronomy antennas that are on different continents, um, up to 40 dB less stringent. So <clears throat> definitely, uh, something we should keep going towards is array, building arrays. Um, and lastly, engineers um, should definitely always, you know, we're always trying to make lower system, lower receiver noise temperatures, especially as we get higher in frequency. Um, and then also high um, <clears throat> IP3 so that we are not, you know, saturating, we're not having the receiver saturate when we get the sidebands of other satellites. Um, more takeaways. Um, so the sa subtracting of signals um, might, I, I don't want to say no longer works. Uh, I should just say might not because um, of costs and then the number of satellites. And then when you're in LEO, you have, you know, satellites moving very fast. Um, the way to uh, you know, get those interference signals um, and, and subtract them would require an array. So it's like to to subtract the signals, you need an array for your array because <laughs> yeah, because they're moving so fast. So yeah, it's it becomes not so feasible. Um, turning off the satellites is not really an option for I think space SpaceX and commercial internet providers. Um, though I will note for SpaceX. Uh, most recently, they, you know, they said they would not use the lower 250 megahertz of the 10.6 to 10.7 gigahertz um, astronomy area. So uh, that's that's very good on them. That's about one eighth of their uh, bandwidth that they have been allocated to use. So uh, I think OneWeb did this said the same as well. But um, yeah. So also keep harmonics out of these. WD, G, Y, those are the, you know, way higher gigahertz um, bands. Uh, so if we can have the actual satellite uh, electronics not produce these seventh order harmonics out in the higher frequency bands, then we can still use them. Um, phased arrays uh, like SpaceX is using um, is great because they're actually able to electronically steer away from astronomy telescopes. Um, and the use of SDRs, I personally found that, that that's probably a, a really good choice when we consider modulations and, and new requirements. Because um, in space policy, I mean, you can't really pass um, 
you can't hinder technology um, by passing, you know, regulations before the technology comes out. So, you know, you, you have to know what you're dealing with and SDRs allow flexibility for there. And then um, I saw this article from Virginia Tech about how we got the CBRS spectrum. And I was looking into that more and watched its presentation. Uh, maybe there's something to gain with spectrum sharing from CBRS. Of course, uh, and CBRS is, um, it's not citizens band, it's citizens uh, broad, um, broadband radio service. And that's for, you know, not passive services, obviously, but they're, they have like a tiered, a three tiered approach of how um, users are able to access the spectrum. And this is licensed users, not unlicensed. Um, so maybe there's something to gain there, but I'm not sure. Um, so the future needs, um, we need to keep improving our interference monitoring, uh, get more data. And ultimately, I think we need a database, an actual database for interference. Um, and this is something that's been mentioned many times before, but just hasn't, you know, come out yet. So, um, and eventually when we have that, we can try dynamic uh, spectrum allocation uh, between services and radio astronomy. Um, we need the advocacy. We need, um, you know, radio astronomers to advocate more um, publicly for this so that we can get the better regulations. Um, and overall education for spectrum managers to uh, be able to calculate like some of these non-trivial uh, sort of power flux densities uh, when we have constellations and different antennas and pointings and all that, um, as well as the policy training. Um, and yeah, so ultimately the arrays is a great idea. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, as I mentioned, the, the thresholds for VLBI are less stringent. Um, and then the thing that I'll leave you with is um, the other thing we can consider is low frequency um, research. So we have the race to higher frequencies, but um, recently, 2018, we had the Netherlands Chinese um, uh, collaboration on uh, something above 30 megahertz. Um, and that was around the moon, dark side of the, yeah, dark, far side of the moon um, satellite. And for radio astronomy, they had a payload for that. Um, and then this is just something I found on a research paper proposing, you know, below 30 megahertz uh, instruments, array interferometer instruments that uh, we can um, consider uh, for the future. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot to be, um, to be studied at this frequency um, because of the ionosphere uh, blocking these uh, lower wavelengths. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of incentive to do this, um, especially because if you wanna try a raise in space for radio astronomy at high frequencies, um, you run into some problems like, you know, phase noise is one thing that you need to consider. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the electronics become you know, harder to keep uh, stable, I guess, and, and the cost also. So um, the lower frequency approach is uh, definitely a fair, favorable one um, that we should be looking at. And that's, uh, that's everything I have. And I'll take, let's see if we can answer, if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Carlton Worsting. I just wanted to point out that the uh, the reason we have arrays is it allows us to mathematically simulate a large a larger radio antenna than that we than we can normally could construct. Therefore, we can resolve uh, we can create pictures with finer resolutions. Yep. Yep. I just wasn't sure if we covered that. So just so that people know why we would want an array. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes, like when you explain to somebody that. When the VLA, like when their array of 27 antennas is, is most, you know, farly spaced out, it's getting smaller, uh, better resolution than it would when it's tightly, um, you know, configured. So 
Yeah, I think it has, a, it has like four different configurations plus uh, three partial, I guess, sub configurations or something. I was out there for, I, I went out there also to Arecibo and to the uh, Green Bank Telescope. Oh, very nice. Yeah, Arecibo is the other one that has the flight restriction. I was forgetting. And Thanks. that's for obvious, you know, radar. <laughs> Yeah the, yeah, the interesting thing about Arecibo is it has a, uh, it's able to broadcast like in the uh, terawatt range, EIRP, and then it, it, it can be used in conjunction with the uh, Green Bank Telescope to do radar astronomy. Right. But radar astronomy can only work out to the orbit of Saturn due to losses. Beyond that, oh. the losses are too great. Any other questions? I mean, I, I don't want to dominate everything. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Uh, any any other questions? I was going to ask one that is now. Um, oh, I think going back to like the the spectrum uh, that you showed as, as far as what is all um, the ones that are on passives. I, I think there were some other ones or ones that you had circled there, and I think you did touch upon that. Um, that it's sort of I think goes to uh, some of the, the citizen broadband um, thing about um, the spectrum sharing and that there is, I guess there is some of that already going on, right, as far as some of those passives uh, bands that, um, you know, the radio astronomy portion of that is is secondary uh, sometimes, or maybe it's the primary kind of thing, or it's it's shared at least with, with some other kind of use, right? Yeah, I was, I was curious, like, so I mentioned TDMA, like TDMA and NFDMA seem like they should be used more um, so that I think the idea would be so that, you know, we're not always moving to new frequencies and taking up space um, as opposed to CDMA where, you, you know, you're actually using more wide bandwidths and then you would kind of be counterproductive there. But yeah, I think the idea would be to use TDMA, FDMA, but I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, certainly anybody else uh, has any other questions, feel free to. I have a, a couple of uh, maybe quick comments that just to maybe spark your interest a little bit more. Um, so you mentioned the uh, far side, uh, the, the test that they did earlier in uh, 2018. Uh, there is another big proposal on the table that's actually called far side and has it turned into an acronym. Uh, that we're somewhat involved in as a very, very tiny piece of that. Uh, but the idea is deploying a low frequency radio telescope on the far side of the moon uh, that has up to, I think it's like 250 some elements uh, that make up the array. Um, and it's pretty neat uh, overall concept. It's led by JPL, Caltech, and some folks in Colorado. Um, but the fun part for us, if, we, if it happens and if we get to kind of ride its coattails, is uh, calibration. They have issues calibrating the beam and they want to make sure they're uh, pointing in the right direction and, and have a good handle on the pattern, um, which is really hard to do with large arrays at low frequencies. Um, so the concept that uh, we're hopefully going to get involved with, and Dr. Ellingson is actually part of this as well, um, is flying small sets as calibration transmitters uh, to work in conjunction with the radio observatories to do pattern measurement. Uh, so it's a kind of really neat, meticulous problem to control all the little, how many unknowns do you have and how do you control them and get them down to a manageable level? Um, and then how do you cram all that kind of electronics into a small set? Uh, with the idea being that we'll fly one over Earth in the proof of concept phase for the, um, um, oh God, uh, long wavelength array out the Owens Valley uh, Radio Observatory, the long wavelength array that's out there. It's similar to LOFAR, uh, but it's a little bit different. Um, and then same thing, but do it again around the moon. Um, so we're, it's still, you know, way up in the air, no idea if it's going to happen or not. But if you're looking for graduate school concepts, things to work on that are related, um, that might be a fun area to get involved with. Um, wow. There's also a couple of other missions that I'm not sure if you've heard of. They're pretty neat. There's, there's one called Sunrise um, out of JPL. It's a 6U CubeSat um, interferometer. It's going to fly out beyond the geo belt uh, specifically to do low frequency solar observations, um, which is pretty wow. cool. So, 
just uh, yeah, no question in there. Just maybe throwing out some some stuff that's going on, maybe a little bit closer to home than you thought. If you're looking for more areas to get involved and and do things with. Do you know what the download uh, yeah. frequency that they're planning for? Which one? For the first one. Uh, no, that's so. If that mission goes forward, it'll be a like a billion dollar flagship NASA uh, major mission. Um, so what they're what we're thinking, our guess is what they'll likely do is have a dedicated. Uh, uh, I'm gonna mix this up. I think L2, Lagrange point. Uh, so the the Earth Moon, I think it's L2, the one that's beyond the moon. Um, they'll fly a you know they can see the far side of the moon. Um, that's L2. They'll fly a com relay at, at that location or around in a halo orbit around that location. Um, and then relay through that. So it'll probably use like your standard NASA uh, frequencies like K band or, or X band uh, for the relay for that. Yeah, China already has a, uh, I think a relay station orbiting around that to maintain communication yep. with its uh, rover on the far side of the moon. That one's called QCAL, I think, if I'm saying it right. And actually as part of an AOE senior design project, we, we observed the uh, S band downlinks from that one. Uh, I, th I think it's L2. If I'm getting my Lagrange points right, uh, yeah, that it, it's pretty neat. Uh, and so yeah, so I think I think NASA would like build a completely dedicated spacecraft for that. Um, originally, they were hoping that uh, the Gateway would be some kind of com relay for them, but Gateway is not flying in the right orbit anymore for what they want to do. Um, something changed with the overall Gateway concept, and that shot that in the foot. So, um, well, last I heard, yeah, it's, so uh, it's pretty cool. Okay. Well, as I heard, Gateway, well, last I heard, I'm not sure if they changed it recently, Gateway is orbiting between two Lagrange points because due to the uh, lumpiness of lunar gravity, you can't have a stable lunar, low lunar orbit, so you have to, you have to uh, orbit far enough away from it to maintain some sort of uh, stability, otherwise you use too much fuel on uh, station keeping due to how right. lumpy, you know. That's right, yeah, thing. the... Uh... The one they're doing now is the near rectilinear halo orbit, I think, and it's, I think it's closer. It, it, it relies heavily on L1, I believe, uh, for its kind of nominal location. Well, last I heard, I think it, I think it orbits like between L1 and L2. Uh, that that well, was I actually had SPK simulations of this that a student did, and I should know the answer to this better than I do right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, from what I read, I think it's between L1 and L2, but maybe incorrect. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the details. The, the, the main point for the far side mission, though, is whatever the change was that they made, which was this change I'm talking about was over a year ago, mm -hmm. um, so nothing, nothing recent. Um, it would not be able to support the far side mission the way they had hoped, uh, which I believe was heavily part of that, that being the com relay part of it. Um, so instead now, I think the proposal is including, including this dedicated com relay out at L2. Um, that's why it's, you know, part of this huge, um, you know, much larger than normal NASA sort of flagship mission, um, if it gets funded. Yeah. So, so coming back to, to this a little bit, Adam, and maybe a question for you or maybe something that you've seen is um, some of this, I, 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 I know, like I said, but to bring it back to the example that maybe many of us are familiar with um, of like the optical astronomy part of that being a problem, um, has there been studies or research, and maybe it's already done and maybe you've, you've looked into it, of, of basically how much, I mean, I, I, I think I understand that, and it's not, to, I guess, to say that um, this isn't a problem and, you know, all this is just, you know, uh, Kind of big fluff of, of, of worry that we shouldn't be worried about. But I guess at, at what point, or has it been studied about? You know, when, uh, when, do, when will we know, or what's kind of the, the threshold at which point of uh, the X number of satellites that go up uh, for these, you know, SpaceX and and OneWeb constellations, um, that this all becomes a that I, this does become like a problem where it basically is. Is no longer feasible to uh, to to do radio astronomy on Earth. Yeah, as far as like the number goes, um, I've seen that um, you know experts in the area were saying that for this year, 2020, with like the 1,000, I think it's 
over a thousand satellites added um, is is fine. It's not a problem. Um, but when you get into the forty thousand, um, I think uh, I think there's there's still things like the combination of everything that I mentioned can actually you know make it doable. Um, but it, I think it comes down to the actual spectrum and protecting it is really um, the biggest thing that we can do um, to keep it to keep it possible. Um, yeah, enforcing better better um, you know guidelines for satellites, um, you know, so they're not always overdriving the amplifiers. <coughs> and going non-linear and pushing the sidebands out into the protected parts. So um, optical astronomy was, I mean, in, in the, I know in the late 90s is when you, they started actually seeing satellites um, in the optical telescopes, but it wasn't really a problem. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to now, you, you, they were, I don't think they were expecting that uh, optically, like, they would be magnitude of three, um, more like seven or nine, I think is, is what they were expecting. So the fact that they are so bright is, is that problem. And then also like you can, for optical, you can't just, I guess, paint it black as something, as some uh, articles have mentioned is like, then you have infrared astronomy problems. So yeah. And I guess as, as we were talking, talking it out, I, I was realizing that one of the other, um, I guess, good news things for the radio astronomy is that uh, many of them are passive. I guess in the sense where um, you're doing the radar astronomy with Arecibo, um, that's that's not so good uh, because the with the optical one, you you can't turn off the sun, right? The sun's always going to be shining, so that's that's the that's the issue is that that's your signal source um and that's what's doing the you know is causing the reflection like or not what's causing it but that's uh, one part of of that link of the reflection and the radio astronomy is maybe a, a good uh is maybe not as uh panicky as maybe what the optical astronomy is because at least then you know they're on the on the passive side where they're not um you know, kind of able to control that, I guess, a little bit better. For sure. Okay. Very cool. Um, yeah. Any any other questions? Uh, I got one last comment for for Adam. Sure. Uh, one thing, if you're interested, uh, we weren't able to do it this year because of COVID craziness, but. Um, if you're looking to, for like maybe opportunities to go back out to another radio observatory, uh, GNU Radio it has been trying to sponsor these hack fests out at the Hack Creek Observatory, and RFI is one of the main like things that they're looking into um, using GNU Radio solutions for that. Um, so it's pretty cool. They've already done one hack fest. They they do these hack fests every so often and have kind of special focus topics. Uh, one of them was uh, using Arecibo to talk to the IZ3. Uh, as part of a reboot attempt back a couple years ago. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in uh, maybe getting back out and playing with SDRs and radio telescopes, um, there might be an opportunity to um, set you up for, uh, usually to do them in the summer. So maybe in summer of 2021, if they try to repeat their uh, Hat Creek visit like they tried to this year, um, we might be able to find a way to get you out there. It's a lot easier to find funding to send students out to things like that than it is for faculty sometimes. <laughs> uh, but if you're interested, Thank well, you. you know that's the thing that's going on. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I, I attended that GNU radio conference for this year, the virtual. That was really cool. Seeing like phased, phased array um, beam forming presentation yep. was pretty cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I have one comment. Uh, I was recently involved in a discussion with the on the, with the AIAA uh, about uh, some people were looking at the possible looking at how what, what would you need to do to put a uh, tel radio telescope on the far side of the moon and we're we're talking about uh, uh, lunar dust and how to handle that because 
sometimes it gets charged and sometimes it actually can even levitate as the moon goes path through the uh, Earth's magneto tail. So it can creep up on the equipment and interfere with the signal that way. Yeah, I think the the one thing that the far side of the moon like station for radio astronomy has it going for it is the low, the very low temperature uh, makes it pretty easy, easier to keep the receiver temperatures low. Uh, are you, it has it has a wide temperature swing. Okay. It's not dark. Remember, it gets up to like 200 degrees in the uh, daytime and like negative, I guess, 160 at night or something like that. Some some huge temperatures. Wow. One thing, one thing it does have going for it though is the, and maybe kind of related to what you're getting at there, Adam, is the it blocks all of Earth, right? All radio sources from Earth are never exposed to it, so sure, it, yeah. <laughs> it it has a low noise temperature, but the thermal temperature might vary wildly. Um, but that That's overall noise kind of condition is a lot better, right. and there's no ionosphere. It would uh, open up almost every single frequency that is currently blocked by uh, terrestrial signals. Right. I guess that's a, uh, a dot, 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 and that's until uh, radio regulations extend to, to, the, to the moon. Of course, uh, satellites, for deep space satellites, are also now looking at the optical transmissions due to uh, using lasers, I guess. I've been, I've been doing some reading about that. Yeah, there is a there is a paper on in the ITU for the far side protection for radio astronomy. I haven't read the details, but it's there. Okay. Uh, if there's any other any other questions, um, I guess I'll yeah, I'll uh, pop oh. pop up with one. Oh sure. Uh, change tracks here completely. A uh, real nice talk, Adam. Sparks lots of interesting discussion and thoughts. Uh, can you tell us a bit about this essay contest that you participated in? Sure. Yeah. Um, so they're called the Space Sustainability um, Conference, um, and they had the first one last year. Um, and this uh, this year, of course, it was virtual. Um, but they had an, they had a student essay contest. So I guess they announced it maybe a month or so before. Um, and they had like five categories. Um, I think it was five around that. And one of them was, the uh, question was something like, uh, what, how should stakeholders in uh, radio astronomy and uh, I guess spectrum usage, how should they manage large satellite constellations? Um, so it was all, all, the, all the categories were policy-based. Um, and I chose that one because I already, I had previously written an article on this topic for uh, the Space Review um, website, uh, I guess a year ago or so. Um, so basically kind of redid that and it was, it was pretty short. It's only about a few pages, but, or less than that, but um, yeah. And there was a $500 uh, cash prize for all the, for each category. Yeah, well, congratulations. And uh, yeah, this is a, a, a great bit of uh, uh, research policy mix, you know, it's a compendium of things and working scientists need to know more about these policy issues. Clearly, <laughs> radio astronomy is in danger. Uh, other, you know, other communities will also feel pressure from, uh, from this quarter. So thanks. Absolutely, yeah. One of the biggest pressures is that uh, demand for uh, radio frequencies just keeps on increasing over time. Yes, and just, we already have small, small area for radio astronomy. Especially with uh, 5G coming up, that's going to be a big one. Yeah, that's another thing that the interference uh, techniques, mitigation techniques will have to counter. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everybody uh, for joining us. And uh, like I said, I'll, I'll wrap this up here um, and uh, I'll be
looking at uh, getting this recording up on uh, YouTube uh, here in the uh, coming days. So thank you for everybody for joining us. And uh, again, uh, as a reminder, we'll have another one of these. Um, we'll try to have the space ones every other week, um, but we'll have this one, uh, a joint one with um, the Center for Geospace Storms uh, coming up uh, just next week. And I'll be uh, sending out information for that. So thank you everybody for joining.